Well, when we start learning about physiology, we have to learn about homeostasis. This is one of the most fundamental principles in physiology. Homeostasis describes the many mechanisms in the body that keep the environment in the body just right, at just the right physiological parameters for the cells to work properly. So we don't want it to be too hot, we don't want it to be too cold. We don't want it to be too wet, we don't want it to be too dry. We don't want it to be too acid, we don't want it to be too alkaline. There are many things that must be homeostatically regulated to keep them just right. The modern way of describing this is the body needs to be in the Goldilocks zone. The porridge wasn't too hot and the porridge wasn't too cold. It's got to be just right. For physiology to work, many parameters in the body need to be homeostatically regulated. Now, homeo means the same, as in homeogeneous. So things are the same. So in homeostasis, the homeo part means the same. Stasis actually means not moving, standing still. So things need to be kept the same, they need to stand still, they need to be the same, they need to be in the same range, in the same narrow parameter so that the physiology works properly. So homeostasis literally means something like, well, literally means same standing, standing still. And it's a dynamic equilibrium. These things are in equilibrium, there's not too much and there's not too little. But to keep it like that, the body's got to be constantly fine-tuning. It's a dynamic process of standing still, homeostasis. Now, there's four useful terms when we think about homeostasis, and the first is disruptor. A disruptor is something that will tend to change a homeostatic parameter. So if you go running, or it's a hot day, you're going to get hotter, that's going to tend to disrupt thermoregulation and temperature homeostasis. Or if you don't drink for a period of time, you're going to get a little bit thirsty and dehydrated. Or if you're going to drink a lot, you might, the tendency would to become fluid overloaded. You'll be getting too much fluid in the body. So these things can disrupt the balance and we want the balance to be maintained. So there's possible disruptors. But then in the body, there's things that detect the particular parameter we're considering at the time. So there's detectors that detect the disruption. And then there's some sort of control system, some effectors that bring it back into a homeostatic range. So we can think about disruptors, detectors, control systems and effector systems. And all this is necessary because of physiology going on primarily inside the cells. So inside the body, of course, we have untold billions of cells. And in those cells, there's biochemical, physiological processes going on all the time. So let's think about an individual cell now and try and relate that to these principles of homeostasis. So here we have a body cell an individual body cell. And inside this body cell, there's all sorts of biochemistry going on. So substance A needs to be converted to substance B. That is a biochemical reaction. And of course, there's many millions of these biochemical reactions going on throughout the body. And this is facilitated by an enzyme. So, in order to have life, we need biochemical reactions going on. In order to have biochemical reactions going on, we need to have the chemicals that are going to take part in the reaction, and we also need to have the enzymes. And we can start thinking about physiology, the physiology of homeostasis, in terms of enzymes. So, for example, for enzymes to work, the pH needs to be finely regulated. The reason for this is that the enzymes are proteins. They're complex structures and they have folded arrangements to give them a particular shape. 
And if the pH changes, that can alter the nature of the enzymes. And if the enzymes are denatured, they will stop performing their biochemical function. And if the enzymes do not perform their biochemical function, that means they will not catalyze the reaction from A to B. That means we won't have the biochemistry. If we haven't got the biochemistry, that means we won't have the physiology. If we haven't got the physiology, that means we no longer have life. So the enzymic environment must be correct in terms of pH. And also in terms of temperature. The temperature must be right for the enzymes to function. Enzymes do not like being too hot and enzymes do not like being too cold. They must be at just the right temperature. And also, if we're going to have chemistry going on inside the cells, we need these things to work. Do you remember the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, the organelles with infolded inner membranes? So the mitochondria need to work to generate energy. And of course, this means in order to generate energy, we're going to need nutrients. For example, we're going to need glucose. So we're going to need a certain amount of glucose in the environment around about the cell. And the environment around about the cell is primarily the extracellular fluid. In this case, the fluid around about the cell is the tissue fluid or the interstitial fluid. The cellular environment needs to contain glucose to provide energy. And of course, if we're going to have glucose to provide energy, the glucose is no good unless we've got the oxygen to combine the glucose with. So as well as having the right amount of glucose, we don't want too much glucose, so we're hyperglycemic. We don't want too little glucose, so we're hypoglycemic. We want just the right amount. And we need oxygen as well. We need the right amount of oxygen, so the oxygen can also diffuse into the cell, facilitating energy production. And of course, if we're going to have oxygen, then we need the blood supply to deliver the oxygen into the tissue fluid. So we need the capillaries with the red blood cells coming along perfusing the tissues, supplying the oxygen. This means we need the right amount of red blood cells. We don't want too many red blood cells, so the blood is too thick and viscous. We don't want not enough red blood cells, because that would make the patient anemic, and there would be insufficient delivery of oxygen. So we need the right amount of red blood cells. And of course, if we're going to get the red blood cells perfusing, if we're going to get the red blood cells going through the circulatory system, we need the right amount of blood pressure to facilitate the perfusion of blood through the tissues. So we need the right amount of materials and pressures in the blood to maintain the integrity of the, the homeostasis and integrity of the tissue fluids to maintain the intracellular environment, the environment inside the cell that actually facilitates the biochemical processes that give rise to life. And of course, as well as glucose, we're going to need other nutrients for biochemical processes. We're going to need amino acids. We're going to need fats. We're going to need vitamins and we're also going to need minerals. So we're going to need a whole range of nutrients to supply the environment in the cell with all the biochemical substrates, with all the chemicals needed to facilitate the biochemistry in the cell at just the right rate. Now, a lot of cellular activity is controlled by the endocrine system. And of course, the endocrine system is based on hormones. So in the blood, 
and therefore in the tissue fluid we need just the right amount of endocrine hormones. Many hormones have to be homeostatically regulated at very precise levels. We don't want too much of them and we don't want too little of them. Too much or too little of an endocrine hormone will give rise to an endocrine disorder. If we've got just the right amount of endocrine hormones, homeostatically regulated to be in a precise physiological range, they will control the biochemical activity inside many of the cells of the body. In fact, virtually all of the cells of the body are subject to some endocrine influences. Also, the cellular environment needs to contain the right amount of water and the right amount of electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, chloride ions and the other electrolytes need to be present in just the right amount. So, for example, if there's too much water in the extracellular fluid, if there's too much water, water will tend to diffuse into the cells and blow the cells up. Conversely, if there's not enough water in the extracellular environment, if the patient's dehydrated, there's not enough water, then osmosis will mean that water will tend to diffuse from the cell into the tissue spaces, resulting in dehydrated cells. So we need the right amount of water and we need the right amount of electrolytes. Some cells in the body are described as being excitable cells. That is, there is an electrical potential difference across their surface membranes. Nerve cells and muscle cells, for example, are excitable cells and require just the right amount of electrolytes on both sides of the cell membrane so there can be electrical activity in the nerve cells and in the muscle cells. But we need just the right amount, not too much and not too little. And all the time as this cell works, as there's biochemical processes going on inside this cell, it's going to produce waste products. So there's going to be carbon dioxide produced, There's going to be nitrogen-containing waste products produced, such as ammonia. And these are very toxic. If these are allowed to build up to toxic levels, they will stop the biochemical function inside the cell. And indeed, they will eventually kill the cell. So these need to be got rid of. These need to be excreted somehow. They need to be got rid of. So as well as having many parameters at just the right level, we need to get rid of the waste products to maintain the homeostatic environment so everything is in a physiological range inside the cell to promote cellular function. Well, there's just a few examples of parameters that need to be homeostatically regulated in order for the cells to generate this mystical phenomena that we refer to as life.